Smith. I'm Timmy. Are you from Texas? I always wanted to go to Texas. Hi, Timmy, honey. I ain't from Texas. I just love country and western music, that's all. Why don't you come in and pop off a few comments? Can I, Miss Dixie? Can I? Sure you can, Timmy.
Prime Ike, the owner huh? of the Midway. And Termite, Otto. The answer is Termites. And Termites are Furman and Furman. I know the truth, and it's deep and dark, but I don't know what to do about it. Modern your clothes into a man and off your back. Gold bullion. All my money is in gold bullion, and it's hidden here on the midway. Here on the midway. Oh, my, my, you're awake. I'm here. Mr. Ted, what are you doing in here? It's one of my favorite places, Timmy. So dark and so quiet. Like a cave in the forest I used to visit when I was young. I'm going to tell you a story, Timmy. All about a poor, sad little boy. The little boy always said that the first thing he ever remembered seeing was a pair of cowboy boots. In his memory, those boots were attached to legs that somehow stretched upwards into an unknown infinity inhabited by the rest of his father. His next memory was that of a, a hand quickly dropping out of that vast beyond and hitting him on the head. Although the boy quickly grew to despise this giant father, there was one thing about him that he liked in spite of its cold-hearted appearance. His father's butterfly collection. Although he loved the collection, he thought that things of beauty should never be killed. And he hated watching as his father pierced the struggling insects. The sad boy loved all beauty and believed that ugliness indicated the presence of death. He was three years old when he committed his first act of ugly liberation. The process which he used to release pain and free ugliness trapped inside of living creatures. He was playing alone outside of his mother's cabin when he found a baby bird struggling on the ground. The bird's eye had been penetrated by a sharp bone protruding out through the skin of its badly broken wing. It was the ugliest thing the sad little boy had ever seen, and he immediately picked up a large rock and crushed the helpless creature. After the boy and his mother moved away from their tiny cabin in the woods, he began to encounter many more creatures in pain which, of course, caused the number of ugly liberations to dramatically increase. In an ironic memorial to my, his despised departed father, the boy collected bits of, of, of hair, of bones, skin, and, and other artifacts from these incidents and shaped them to look like butterflies. It was shortly after his father's death when the sad little boy started his own unusual butterfly collection. His next act was the liberation of all the dead insects in his father's collection 
by burning the dead man's house. In emotional strength, the boy's hatred of his father was matched only by a deep and powerful love for his mother. Even though she earned her living as a circus freak, he saw within her a beauty unmatched in his detached observations of the world. She performed with a number of different freak shows as they traveled around the country together. For some strange reason, their movement from show to show always seemed to happen after the mysterious deaths of other star performers. I still see that sad little boy around here sometimes, Timmy. He deeply frightens me. But I don't think you have anything to worry about. He tells me that he still collects butterflies, though. Wow, Mr. Ted. I guess it's a good thing I'm not ugly. It's very good, Timmy. It's very, very good. Gosh, mister, you look tired. Life is tired, little boy. Would you like to watch my mother perform? I'm Timmy, mister. I like everything around here. Childhood is a terrible thing, Timmy.
got married and I was deeply in love with that giant guy. Our lives were sweet and our roses were red. And soon we had us a baby named Ted. But two things happened before too long that turned my rightness into wrong. Soon my skin resembled prunes, but that was nothing next to the tree that crushed poor Tommy as he rescued me. I wish that I had died instead, and maybe I would have except for Ted. I was so far down and near to death that I had to go up just to be one day Ted and me passed a county fair And I stopped in in spite of all the stairs At first it was nice to see Ted having fun But I never expected to feel so stunned As I did right after both of us went To see something called Freaks in of a tent. They were scraps of humanity banded together like grandma's quilts. And after that, I never went back to that cabin, but found a new home where we were cooking the way dogs taking bones. can't talk now. Bye bye, honey pie.
What's up, sport? I'm from the IRS, ma'am. Could I see your tax return? Sorry, big boy, but it's not on me. But if you come to my show a little later, I could find it for you. You should have your tax return with you at all times, ma'am. But you look like an honest woman, so I'll give you a break this time. But you have that return when I come back later. Excuse me, ma'am, but you've got a problem. I know, honey. I'm almost out of ammo, and I'm too broke to buy any more. Excuse me, ma'am. What I mean is, you have a tax problem. I'm from the Internal Revenue Service, and I need to see all your 1040s, all your Schedule C's, and all your receipts for the last five years. But my husband, Ike, he always took care of all that stuff, and now he's sick in bed with a bad coma! I'm sorry to hear that, ma'am, but that's not my problem. You've got two hours before I shut this place down. Excuse me, ma'am. I'll be back later. I'm Timmy, mister. Who are you? You sure look important. I am important, Timmy. I work for your government. Super wow, sir. You must be proud to have such an important job. Timmy, I'm proud to live in a great country like America. I know that you're just a child, but... You're never too young to learn that there are always people trying to tear down this great country of ours. And it's my job to stop those people. It's a big responsibility, but somebody has to do it. Jimmy, do you love your country? Yes, sir, Mr. Government Man. That's good, Timmy. I can tell that you're a fine young man. I hope you will consider a career in the IRS. Your government needs you, Timmy. I'm sorry, but I have to go now, son. Cheaters don't take coffee breaks. It's all about bow-wows. Bow-wows and boys, boys. And it all started with Daddy. Daddy, a bad cop who became a worse dog trainer. Can you imagine, boys? He even tried training me, his little princess, to be a baby ballerina. But then there was this guy, you see. There's always been at least one. And this guy followed the little princess home. Home, where Daddy was. Daddy in the safety of his big, strong arms. But Daddy wasn't there. Daddy was next door doing a uh, little repair work for his best friend's wife. The sound of the little prince's screaming eventually brought Daddy back, just in time to see the guy being 
greeted by one of Daddy's German shepherds. No thanks to Daddy, the little princess was saved, just like in all good fairy tales. But she never forgot. And who was the guy? He was just someone that Daddy met in a liquor store. A guy who cried and said he needed the money for his sick daughter. His sick daughter who died while the guy was in jail, getting madder and madder and finally becoming consumed with rage at the cop who laughed at the story of his dying daughter. But he never got his revenge, and the princess never forgot the brave German shepherd that saved her life. Eventually, she grew up and got involved with men. Men like Huck and Chuck, the bumbling twin bodybuilders who fought for her affection. And eventually inspired the first of her many tattoos. A perfect pair of Dobermans, one on each thigh. And of course, there were more, lots more. But they all turned into dogs. And the dogs turned into tattoos. And the tattoos turn you on, don't they, boys? And wouldn't you all just love to become the bad bulldog on my belly? And what about love? Love is simply black or white, in or out, top or bottom, until it's over. Like my love for Daddy. The lovely little chihuahua on my butt. Bye-bye, boys. Excuse me. I'm sure you have no idea why I'm subjecting you to this seemingly cruel and heartless death. Please understand, I take no personal pleasure from the infliction of pain, but I do abhor ugliness. And you are ugly. Ugly in the feelings found in your soul. Ugly in the thoughts that make up your mind ugly in the aches that you hold in your heart. But I will liberate you from all this ugliness. I will deliver the peace and serenity unavailable in this cesspool of slime we call a world. It won't last long and please feel free to let your mind scream. Death is beautiful. I can only envy your impending freedom. Goodbye, my friend. Goodbye. Gosh, mister, you look tired. Life is tired, little boy. Would you like to watch my mother perform? I'm Timmy, mister. I like everything around here. Childhood is a terrible thing, Timmy.
Come here, Timmy. I want to show you something. It's very special to me. These are not just any bugs, Timmy. They're sentimental keepsakes from very special moments. Wow! Yes, Mr. Ted! I love bugs! Thank you, Timmy. I knew you would like my butterflies. They're so beautiful. gotten any money, Otto. We ain't had much of a crowd around here since the accident. Well, well, maybe we can work out something else. You know what I'm gonna do with that letter if you're not nice to me? Real nice? You know what I mean. No, I don't know what you mean. And you better go now. I'm expecting Lottie to show up here any minute. Lottie, what does that sort of little stump want? Oh, look, you better play ball. Nobody welches on Otto. There's a tear in my beer, buddy, but it ain't for you. What's up, Sport?
too bad, Tubby. Yes. Can I help you, gentlemen? Are you swan? Maybe. Dr. Carver from the research lab sent us. He said you had some, uh, supplies for his experiments. Ah, yes, yes. Come in. This way, my good man. <laughs> hey, look at this one. Real strange. Let's have a look at him. Wow, what a beaut. I'll bet old Doc Carver's gonna want to give that guy some uh, special attention. Yeah. He'll want to cut him up and find out about that wacko coloring. Here, put him in this plastic container to keep him separate from his fellow rodents. This is the story of a very special rat. The rat didn't know that he was special, nor did he know what a lucky rat he was destined to be. Indeed, he knew nothing of that very human concept called luck. Mainly, he thought about food, and up to this point, food had not been a problem. He had been well fed by Swan, the rat catcher, and had no idea that it was possible to run out of food. Or luck. But it was the rat's luck, some might say destiny, that swept him along that day. The rats, they're loose. Help! They're all over! Oh, look out! Luck had reared its indifferent head. And instead of sinking to the bottom of the river with his rodent kin, the rat, floating in a lightweight plastic container, was carried by the current down the river. Now the rat discovered something new. Fear. As he tossed about in this closed container, this fear became an almost tangible presence. Alone and hungry, he was haunted by feverish visions of the humans responsible for his plight accompanied by the hovering specter of death. But as the final reality of certain death closed in, Luck looked his way one more time. Oopsie-daisy! Before the accident, Ike often asked Dixie to push him down by the river when he felt overly burdened by life. Attendance had been sagging at the midway recently, and the owner felt that a new attraction was needed. As he watched the river, Something caught his eye, and Ike asked Dixie to pick up a small container near the bank. Peering into the dark container, Ike first glimpsed what appeared to be an eerie red star, mysterious and alive. It only took a moment to realize what he had, and Ike's dark mood was immediately lifted. He knew an omen when he saw one. Unlike the rat, Ike knew all about luck. He understood it and worshipped it. Instantly, he had a vision. And soon the rat, whom Ike had named Oscar, was celebrated as the star of the Midway's new attraction. But the concept of fame meant no more to Oscar than the one called Luck. Once again, he was being fed by a human, a dirty, smelly, noisy human, and that was all he knew. Night after night, the human placed him in a sunken circle, surrounded by bright lights and other howling humans. And Oscar didn't like that very much. Soon, the rat grew troubled and his head filled with dark emotions and disturbing memories. A lack of food, 
death and the dirty human. There was less and less that Oscar liked about these creatures, especially the dirty smelly one. And perhaps he didn't understand luck, fame or fate. But the rat did understand power. And lately, he'd begun to feel a strange, sick, and feverish kind of power. I'm Timmy, mister. Who are you? You sure look important. I am important, Timmy. I work for your government. Super wow, sir! You must be proud to have such an important job. Jimmy, I'm proud to live in a great country like America. I know that you're just a child, but you're never too young to learn that they're all... You're gonna have the time of your life, Timmy, honey. Hiya, big boy. I'm here. Mr. Ted, what are you doing in here? It's one of my favorite places, Timmy.
take care of fucking Chuck. I'm sure you have no idea why I'm subjecting you to this seemingly cruel and heartless death. Please understand, I take no personal pleasure from the infliction of pain, but I do abhor ugliness. And you are ugly. Ugly in the feelings found in your soul. Ugly in the thoughts that make up your mind. Ugly in the aches that you hold in your heart. But I will liberate you from all this ugliness. I will deliver the peace and serenity unavailable in this cesspool of slime we call a world. It won't last long and please feel free to let your mind scream. Death is beautiful. I can only envy your impending freedom. Goodbye my friend. Goodbye.